Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Valley PBS. Today we are chatting with Desiree Johnson, a director of Generational Changes. Desiree has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Desiree, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Generational Changes, what a great name. Thank Tell you. Tell us about Generational Changes, your mission and the people that you serve. Our mission at Generational Changes is to provide um, trauma-informed care and resource parenting for the foster youth of the Central Valley and beyond. Um, there's a huge need for um, resource parents, which it's now called resource parenting. People popularly know it, know it as foster parenting. So um, that's what we're doing. And our mission is just to advocate for our youth, um, make sure all of their needs are met, um, and get them reunified with their families. So trauma-informed care is very important. Yes. A young person who has found their way into foster care, it is definitionally traumatic Correct. to be separated from your family, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances is, because regardless as to whether they are going to a better circumstance or a different circumstance, it is a traumatic event in a child's life to be separated. Correct. The separation itself is traumatic. And often um, these children and these youth have this thing, what we call an invisible suitcase. And so what they bring with them into their resource home is that invisible suitcase. And it might be filled to capacity, busting at the seams of a lifetime or a certain instance of trauma that they've experienced that they haven't receive the care in how to navigate those traumas. So we're very um, attentive to those traumatic experiences that they carry in trying to provide them with um, the holistic care and provide the resource families with the care and the training in navigating and helping those children unpack that. So let's unpack the, that suitcase a bit okay. and, and talk about the types of issues that children need to confront and that you help them to confront through your services? Um, these things could be issues of neglect um, from their families. Um, sometimes they don't stay with their parents. Sometimes they stay with, you know, that distant or close relative, their grandmother or their older cousin or aunt or uncle. And sometimes even when they're in those um, family members' homes, they're experiencing things. And so, it could be um, abuse, instances of um, physical abuse, mental abuse, and you know, oftentimes families, and they try to cover up those things um, and suppress them. And so that's what packs the suitcase. Um, everything that's happened, everything to try to keep it as confidential or between family members as possible, it, it doesn't help to facilitate um, in addressing and helping children heal from those experiences. How do you ensure that this next move to a uh, parent who the child knows will be temporary mm -hmm. or is most likely to be temporary, that that move is not worse than keeping the child in perhaps not an ideal state, well, the but each move is, is, is additive in terms of trauma? You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's also why we try to um, not move children around. Um, we try to, you know, provide services and care while they're in our care um, to the families, whether they're biological or the resource family, and to the child to ensure that they know that they are safe and to just facilitate their care. It's very important that everything is put on the table. Um, that's also why we train our resource parents to understand the impact that they're going to carry with these children. Um, I often, you know, people feel like it's just, oh, I'm welcoming a child, I'm giving them shelter, I'm giving them food, and they're okay. Well, it's not always that simple. And we always want to encourage and make the invisible suitcase the priority. Um, because it's, it's, it, they're really simple things, but they're not. And just the awareness of having to um, care for these youth beyond the obvious, beyond providing them with uh, 
three meals and pro beyond you know taking them to school is very important. So the education of these resource parents is also very very important Absolutely. because without the context without the the awareness of the invisible suitcase and how that suitcase has been packed someone of goodwill who wants to open their house and wants to be generous might not understand why in return they are counting they are encountering anger right. or acting out or abuse right or um, some others beha other behavior in which the response is, what's wrong with you? I'm being so, so kind and nice. Right. So talk about how you bring parents, bring adults into this ecosystem that you shape and how you, you start their education process. When we train our foster, our resource parents, um, what they do is they go through a series of eight three-hour sessions that minimally equal to 24 hours of pre-service training. And so initially we address what they think or what they presume fostering entails. And then we go into detail about and give them examples and conduct exercises on the trauma-informed process of providing and nurturing these, providing for and nurturing these children. Um, and we address all of the age groups from zero to three, five to 10 and then 11 and up. Um, we also serve what we call um, transition age youth. So from 18 to 21, um, we also address their needs and how they obviously differentiate from the younger youth and their freedoms and practices. So um, with that group, we also encourage independence and what that looks like and how they can help facilitate the youth in gaining independence um, healthily. The need is so great, mm -hmm. and children can benefit even if the family might not have um, all of the attributes of the ideal family okay. and all the knowledge of the ideal family. How do you ensure that 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 desire to serve doesn't override your judgment in ensuring that people have the correct environment for a child? Well, we try to establish in the beginning that <clears throat> there is no ideal family. There's, there's a safety component that is number one. Um, you don't have to be married. You don't have to be single. You don't have to be straight or gay. It's, it's not, it's, there's no ideal. It, we, we push for safety and, and mm -hmm. that is our main concern. Um, people have lived you know, regular normal lives before applying to become foster parents. So, you know, with a background check and every legal aspect um, and component that is involved with this application, I don't think there's anybody that will go through the process and not have a desire for it in their heart. I know there's a, a strong need, but through all the steps, eventually you, you discover what is not going to be a good fit mm -hmm. for your ideal or for what should be um, a resource home. Now, once you have placed a child, mm -hmm. what kind of support do you offer? What kind of casework do you do? Um, I, I'm actually on clock 24 seven. <laughs> so, you know, whenever there is an, an outburst or an incident of, you know, a child maybe reacting to something um, traumatic, um, of course they can call the social worker and we offer in-home support care. So we actually conduct all of our visits in the home. We can conduct them at the office as well if they want to you know, visit the office. Um, we ensure that the needs and service plan of that child is followed through and through. And we ensure that through teaming with their county social worker or probation officer, um, their, they could have an advocate or a CASA worker um, and anybody they want involved on their treatment team, be it a teacher or a principal or anybody that has, it, it could even be a past foster, um, foster parent, um, as long as that child is requesting that they be there. And in, in most instances, their biological family is also involved as well. So with a background in analytics and in uh, metrics, mm -hmm. right? you're trying to figure out whether the dollar that is spent is spent effectively. Mm -hmm. 
in this particular case, you're trying to figure out whether the services that you're providing by placing a child and, and the support and the counseling that you're providing is actually effective. Mm -hmm. So it's effective within a context, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have the child have a better life through Absolutely. that experience. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you measure that? How can you assess that? Well, we measure it through um, how many families we approve. We measure it through how many placements that we can put um, in each home and the duration of those placements. Um, but we also have to look at the components as the, perp the, the reason these children are placed mm -hmm. and how long it would take to reach all of the goals that are identified on their, their, on their needs and service plan. Where does the voice of the child heard? At all times. Um, so through teaming, the child is actually a part of the team. And that is the most, one of the, the newer um, components of continuum of care reform is hearing the child and teaming. So no one, no one person is making a decision on behalf of the child solely by themselves. It is a team effort of collaborating with, again, teachers and whoever is involved with this child's life, fam biological family, resource family, advocates, um, court judges, um, attorneys, anybody involved in the case that is involving this child is a part of the team and we collectively make decisions together on behalf of the child. If that child expresses, you know, um, I, I would like my next door neighbor from second grade to be a part of that because this person said this to me and it, for whatever reason, um, we reach out to those people and say, hey, do you know this child? This child is requesting that you be a part of their team in support of meeting their goals, you know? And so we're open to everything the child is requesting or, you know, brings up in, in, an, ideal, in an ideal teaming environment. Desiree Johnson, thank you so much for sharing the work of Generational Changes. Thank you. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.